Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guest today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. My guest today is Joe Leahy. Our conversation rests upon the power of simply sharing from the heart the insights and understandings that have changed your own life, and that this is perhaps the most powerful tool we have for helping others to find similar transformations. Jo talks about her experience working in healthcare for the NHS and how to find the calm in yourself and others so that you can avoid stress, burnout, and overwhelm, even when it seems to be happening all around you. A bit about Joe Leahy. Joe is a retired GP, family physician, living in the UK, who now enjoys life as a transformative coach, working with individuals, practices, and primary care networks to maximize their enjoyment and effectiveness. Joe's family is grown up now, but her three sons are an important part of her life, scattered as they are to different corners of the earth. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Joe Leahy. Hi, Joe. It's so fun to hang out with you in this format. I'm very excited about what we're about to explore, the adventure we're about to go on. And, you know, we both thought that this would be a really good idea to do this first of all because we just want to see what would happen i think yeah but but from my side i know that you have a powerful story and i know that sharing something from our own experience is often the best way to create impact or transformation in someone else you know when when i hear about your story it touches me, you know, the the truth. When I hear about how you've seen the truth, I feel it and it touches me and I have a chance to look there too. And so that's really what I'm hoping that we'll do is kind of like explore what have you seen about what's true, um, in particular about what's touched your life. So I realized that I don't know a lot about your professional background. I mean, I know some of the general things, of course, but would you just give me a little bit of that, your career path in general? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. So um, many, many decades ago, when I emerged uh, from medical school, I went up to the north of Scotland and um, did my residence jobs up there. And then um, went to the Isle of Skye for a year to be a GP trainee. And that was just unbelievable. That that was quite a magical time. Um, I, I kind of wandered through various different things, thought it might be good to do obstetrics in gynecology. And luckily that didn't quite work out for me. So <laughs> I found myself, um, in general practice <clears throat> and um, I think it's fair to say that um, although I've kind of followed my husband's career around the country um, I've usually managed to find some way of working that suited me that was either general practice and or kind of contraceptive services that kind of thing and um, As I've gone along, I've picked up lots of extra kind of things, interesting things that I've kind of added in. So I was really into allergy testing for a while um, in the uh, late 80s. And um, yeah, and what else have I been involved in? Oh, and I, yeah, hypnotherapy, NLP, all sorts of things that have kind of added in there. 
<laughs> and at some point in the mix there, I'd also added a management type job. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of went to the dark side <laughs> as well as staying in general practice till um, September 2017. And it, I first discovered coaching in um, 2002. Let's get that right. Um, and uh, was just blown away by the idea. I just thought, well, that this is what I have been waiting for all my life, kind of thing. And um, found myself a coaching course, which was in, in 2002, it was very much kind of um, the grow model and everything that goes with that. And that was great. And, and I did lots of coaching for a while and then, you know, less for a while and I also um, was involved in setting up um, a leadership program for mostly for doctors in fact locally and and the reason that that's relevant is that uh, the person who um, used to come along and and deliver the leadership program with me and it was his program so I kind of really was uh, his glamorous assistant rather than the other way around. <laughs> um, and he, he discovered the inside out way of thinking and the conversations I had with him and some of the conversations we had within the leadership group were just very powerful. Um, and it, it, it was kind of a slow burner for me. So I was, not not really exactly in the conversation for quite a long time before um, I went on um, a two-day course. Um, Kimberly Hare runs called um, The Heart of Thriving. And um, I, I already knew Kim really well from well before she discovered the inside out way of thinking and um it, that two-day experience was just completely mind-blowing for me um and I think the one insight that really stays with me is a sudden realization that actually I am enough <laughs> I don't need to be doing, 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 doing. I, I'm just enough. <laughs> and I was looking back, I was thinking, when was that? And I think it was either 2017 or 18. And I can't even remember when. I just remember that moment where I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> And then, of course, as these things do, because I wasn't in a conversation in in a more regular way, it kind of didn't exactly fritter away. It was it was there in the background, but most of the time I wasn't aware of it. Mm. And then, I guess it must have been early in lockdown. Um, I just thought, right, enough. It's time to do some serious kind of looking at this and I signed up to coaching mastery with Michael Neal which is where I met you <laughs> in fact I think it was the second coaching mastery that we actually came across each other in breakout rooms that was really weird because you know you see so many different people but we actually spoke to each other at least twice if not three times um but yeah and some of the insights I had from that and most of them came from working in breakouts whether you know just two or three people just really really incredibly powerful I think gradually through staying in that conversation I've just kind of 
not had many of those. I'm not, how, am I allowed to say what Michael calls them on your podcast? Sure you can. Can you say it on yours? <laughs> <laughs> what Michael calls the holy fucking mother of God moments. <laughs> uh, so we now x-ray the, uh, <laughs> the, the both co- podcasts. <laughs> um, it, so there haven't been very many of those. There have been one or two. There was one that was very powerful where it, it was a con- almost um almost a, a a matrix moment of realizing how amazing the whole universe is and my place in it <laughs> uh, that yeah that was really weird um can you can you take me back there joe like what was that like if you go right back to it what was happening in your like what was happening in in that moment in your life and then what did you see so i was in a breakout group with danny cobbins yeah gorgeous guy from texas yeah and i can't even remember the rest of the conversation part of it was about um about family issues, uh, seeing people as broken. And I just, there was something that Danny said that made me realize that this person isn't broken at all. And the absolute truth of us all sitting in perfect mental health, whatever else is going on. And uh, there was just a sense of just limitless kind of being. Does that make any sense to you at all? (laughs) But it was just so powerful. It shut me up completely, which, you know, takes some doing. So... (laughs) Well, I kind of wanted to feed back after the exercise and I, I tried and it wasn't going to happen. I mean, I just said very little and then thought, why did I bother? Because I was just kind of, oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering because, you know, someone who's listening might not be familiar with this thing that we're calling the inside out understanding. Absolutely right. <laughs> what what does that mean for you? Well, I for many years, probably decades, I, I've been very much at the level below that where I recognize that it's not what's happening, it's our reaction to it. But what I hadn't understood was the the role that thought plays in our experience. And that's been the major thing that has made the difference. So um, it's really about our, our experience comes from our thinking about what's happened, just not about what's happening to us out there. And, And, yeah, there are some horrendous things that might be happening to us out there and pleasant things and a whole variety of things. But it's actually what I'm thinking about it that is causing the feeling. And so before, um, before inside that thinking, I would be kind of thinking, right, okay, so the way I'm thinking about this is wrong. I need to think differently about this. And marshal whole ways of thinking that will be much more positive. And, yeah, you recognise that stuff. (laughs) And then the freedom of recognising what's going on in the moment in terms of thought and that I don't need to change anything I just need to recognize what's happening and how magical that is. (laughs) Mm. 
I'm wondering if you could give me an example, Joe, of like how things used to look to you, maybe when you were a general practitioner or, you know, before you had this insight into the inside out nature of our experience that like before you saw that thought was what you were thinking was creating your experience. And it looked like what was happening outside was making you feel a certain way. Right. Like, can you give me an example of that? Like what it looked like before? Um, I suppose the easiest examples in some way are those about what's going on in relationships and, you know, <laughs> how, how we misunderstand each other completely because it looks like someone might be our partner, might be our kids, is doing something so annoying or saying something so annoying that it requires straightening out <laughs> from my perspective <laughs> and actually realizing sometimes right in the middle of this after I've already started the straightening out process is <laughs> uh, oh actually it's my thinking about this and then that just it just kind of falls away and then it's possible to have a more honest and authentic conversation with someone. Mm. As, as well as recognizing that they, you know, whatever they're doing or saying, they, they are doing their very best, given the thinking that looks real to them. <laughs> yeah. And that, that has led to a lot of ease in my relationships, yeah. And sometimes there's ed edgy kind of stuff as well, but not for very long. Yeah. What was it, Joe, that really inspired you to create your podcast, Hang Up Your Superhero Keep? <laughs> It's talking to my colleagues who are still in general practice and really feeling for them. And um, from quite early on in the pandemic, um, initially, everything went very quiet. Nobody wanted to go out. Nobody wanted to contact the doctor unless they thought they had COVID. And Everyone was kind of poised, ready to, you know, um, leap into action. But then when people started to feel, right, enough is enough, you know, where, where are these doctors, you know, they're, they're in this building and we're not allowed in unless we've spoken to them on the phone first and blah, blah, blah. So the, it built up a kind of mythology of GPs not being available. And it really is. A mythology and um, the demand for primary care services just has rocketed and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and uh, my colleagues are getting more and more worn out and you know still struggling with staff sickness as well um so that it's become a very stressful place to work where people are overwhelmed and um, and burning out because they want to do their best for patients. And there's, they're struggling with things like the media um, telling everyone the GPs are just kind of, you know, not doing what they should be and, not opening up access to people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and I've also been coaching some of my colleagues who I've, I've actually found myself saying things like, "What would happen if you took off your superhero cape at this point?" 
<laughs> so that's where that came from, because it was just such a vivid image in my mind of them kind of there, ready to, you know, solve the world, rescue everyone, and actually not taking care of themselves and not recognising also where the feelings are coming from, where the burnout's coming from, and, you know, where the stress is coming from as well. And, of course, there are those external things that are causing the thoughts that, you know, lead to those feelings. And it's there's no doubt that those things exist externally. It would just be great if my colleagues could see where their experience was coming from or maybe make a different decision than some of them who are saying, I've had enough, I need to get out. And, you know, for years they'd been doing a job that was very meaningful for them, very positive, that they've loved, and it's just become too much. And how sad is that? Mm. Yeah, these people who really love what they do and had a heart for it and then yeah. are so burnt out, they're like, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. When we need them. Like, yes. Like there's such a great need right now. Yeah. And we also need each other. So the more uh, the more of my colleagues are saying enough already and going, the more that those who are left have to carry. So it becomes a negative downward spiral. Hmm. So what would you, like pretend that I am one of those colleagues of yours who, and maybe you can even think of someone in particular who is a phenomenal doctor, full of, you know, at their best, in their best uh, their clearest state, right? Like they're just, they're so good. They're so gifted. They're so caring. They're so loving. By the way, that's, that's all of us in our, at our best, right? <laughs> but yeah. they're, they're just like this. And, and yet they are so stressed out right now. So overwhelmed with what's going on, ready to throw in the towel. What would you want? If you could give me a gift what gift would you give me that would change that for me? It would be absolutely that understanding that it's your thinking about what's going on that's causing that burnout, not what's actually happening out there, and allowing you to, to get that peace of mind and access your inner wisdom. And then be able to make decisions that are right for you from that place of peace. Hmm. That's the biggest gift of all, I think. And what if I say to you, but Joe, There's too much for me to do. I just can't. Like, yeah, th my thinking. But look at, this is not my thinking. This list of things I have yeah. to do, these, these protocols I have to follow, these jerks who are asking me to give more when I just don't have it, telling me to, you know, I, I, I need resilience, bouncing back. Like, like, what is that? They're just asking for more. Like, how, how can you help me see that? Because it just, it looks to me like it's all of these things in front of me. Like they're really making me feel crappy. That's, that's whose fault it is. And that's really what it looks like, isn't it? And we've been brought up to believe that that is the case. That stuff happens to us and that we respond to it because we're human beings. But actually, we've missed. The, the way that the mind really works. And yes, that stuff's there and it all needs to be done. And yet, when we come from a place of 
piece, not only do we see what really needs to be done and what doesn't, but we're much more effective at doing what does need to be done. And when we're at peace as well, when people, you know, when angry people come into the room to say, it's been really difficult to get hold of you and I've waited so many weeks to... If I'm... If I am coming from that that place and listening deeply to them with nothing else on my mind, that is what allows people to calm down and, and come back to their own quiet place. And how much easier could it be? It doesn't seem real, and I get that. I really do get that it doesn't seem real. <laughs> where where do I find this piece, Joe? Because it sounds lovely. Where do yes, I find it? it? Yes. Yeah, right inside you. And, and it's just awakening to the fact that what's causing the stress and the burnout and the overwhelm is your thoughts. You don't even need to change them. You just need to recognize. <laughs> you know, I have been kind of, there's a, there's a word for it probably that you would say, but I've been, I've been kind of messing with you a little bit, like pushing, like, come on, like, yeah, this sounds great, Joe, but, but how do I do it? And I yeah. think that, you know, if you're listening to this and you've had a nice feeling, you know, if, if you've, felt something like a little bit easier, a little bit of tension release. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. That's what's available right here in this moment when we come out of our thinking and we're just here. It feels a little better. And sometimes it feels a whole lot better. And just knowing that that's there, even when I don't have that experience in every moment, because I don't, it's, it is that. It is simple. It's beautifully simple. So it, it's sort of like if you can feel it in this moment, that's it. You've already begun. I mean, you've, all, you've had it all along. <laughs> yeah. but, but there, now you're on to it. Now you're beginning to see. Yeah, and it's amazing, isn't it, that we have had it all along, despite all that stuff that's been, you know, piled on top of it it's been there all along Mm. I love sometimes asking myself the question then this is a question that I think I first heard from Byron Katie but I also ask other people when they're upset about something when they're stressed out about something when they're feeling overwhelmed who would you be without that thought if you weren't thinking that What would that be like? And sometimes the answer is, well, I don't know, because it just seems like it's so much apart. But if you can sense it, you're like, oh, well, if I didn't have, what if you didn't have any thinking about it? No thinking, no judgment, no comparison, no disagreement with it or agreement with it. What would it be like? It would just be what is. Yeah. And there's the space around that that opens up such peace. That's like, what's really happening. <laughs> That's it. I, and in many ways, it's very difficult to get that, to understand that until it's happened, I think, even though, you know, we were in that state, weren't we, as babies, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, who like, it's like that? catching it in the moment. Yes. You know, catching it as it's happening. You know that all this, and you can see it because, oh, without that, I don't feel that way anymore. Without the thought that this isn't fair and it should be different, I don't have the feeling. My situation yeah. didn't change. So simple, 
and so powerful. Yeah. Hmm. So what is your hope for your podcast? What do you hope will be the impact that it has? I really hope that it reaches enough of my colleagues that they're, and that they're able to take just a bit of time, maybe on the commute, maybe while they're eating their lunch at the desk, just to pick up enough and to get that feeling that we've talked about and to know, to then understand that it's always there and they can access it whenever they need it. It's not special. It's, it is a superpower, but it's a superpower that we all have. <laughs> yeah. And even better, a superpower that comes from relaxing into what's already there instead of posturing and flexing your muscles and, and it's just getting yourself ready for a fight that's going to be hard and tense and take tons of energy and like, oh, actually, you have what you need here already. Yeah. It could start, I think of it starting a, a chain reaction or spreading like a contagion the kind that we want to have yes a contagion of peace of finding the resources that we already have yeah and slowing down enough to really be able to access them and do what needs to be done to take care of ourselves and others in a way that's sustainable and beautiful and regenerative yeah and and that isn't about the resilience that we're being kind of told that we need in order to survive not that kind of resilience which isn't real real resilience it's kind of it's the old medical machismo thing of you know if you can't stand the heat get out of the kitchen kind of thing you know and you need to man up <laughs> no actually we need to connect with our inner peace and wisdom (laughs) might sound a bit pink and fluffy but it does work (laughs) yeah yeah that's beautiful joe what is it about relationships with other people that (laughs) that turns us into such Like such blame agents is what I want to say. Now, I'm going to fess up to this first, you know, before I ask you to dive in here, because it's only fair. Yeah. Very fair. (laughs) You know, sometimes I really want things to be my partner's fault. Mm. I'm upset about something they're doing or not doing. It's upsetting me, I think. And I really want it. I want to be able to blame it on them. But I've, I've been looking at this for a while. And I know that for one, that feels awful. Yeah. Also, there's nothing I can do about that because I cannot change someone else's behavior. That's true. I can't make them do something or not do something. But I also start to see, because I can feel the tension on it when I say, it's your fault. And I hear, again, the echo of Byron Katie in my mind. It's like, is that true? (laughs) And I start to go, you need to change. Who needs to change? And the fingers turning around and pointing at me, not in judgment, but in recognizing that this is where my experience is created. This is where that frustration is originating in me and Mm -hmm. not in what they're doing, even though it really looks like it. Because like, what if I actually, they're doing the same thing they're doing. 
but I didn't have any thought that they shouldn't be. Well, it wouldn't be a problem then, would it? So the problem can't be in them. The source can't be in them. It's got to be in me. It's got to be happening here. Yeah. And it's very tempting then to switch the blame to ourselves, isn't it? Instead of recognizing this isn't about blame at all. <laughs> yeah. So what are you seeing about that? Um, well, I guess that we're all human. So we all drop into that by mistake now and then, don't we? I mean, o- over the weekend, we got with Easter and we can family come in for the day and um a really stupid thing was Andrew my husband a whipping cream to go on top of a trifle and it was a long story all, all to do with Nigella Lawson and keeping cream out of the fridge and putting tahini in it long story won't bore you with that but it the cream went very solid very quickly and I thought, just not good enough to go on top of the trifle, actually. <laughs> and he was putting it on top of the trifle right, with a trowel. <laughs> so I got some more that had also been out of the fridge. And I whipped up some more. And he did exactly the same for me. I was like, oh, God, now I can't even blame him <laughs> for whipping the cream too much. I mean, how stupid was all that, honestly? And it's when it's just that realization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What did you see was happening? Like, tell me. Like, so you were caught up in it. Like, this isn't right. You, yeah, you're there, doing it wrong. <laughs> there was a whole story about whipping the cream in the wrong way. <laughs> And then when it turned out wrong, putting it on the trifle anyway. <laughs> and then, do you know something? Just, everybody ate it and really liked it. Why is that funny now? Because I'm <laughs> betting that if you still had that story, you could be mad about it even right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it's funny right now. Yeah, it is because it's, it's that realization of what was I on, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like catching yourself high on the delusion of thought. Yeah. That something okay. should be the way it's not something should be other than what it is. Someone should be doing something other than what they're doing. And man, is that sometimes so hard to see when you're in it, but as soon as you're not in it, you can laugh at it because that is a funny story. And it's, it seems so very trivial now, right? Like I think we can say that both of us, like it's whipped cream (laughs) on a dessert. Like nobody's dying here. You know, it's, I think, you know, wow. But we all do that. Yeah. And when it comes down to it and we don't see it and with certain things, we can do it with something like whipped cream. We can do it with something like someone like we actually are physically harmed in some way or illness or a million other things that just that story unrecognized can create so much suffering without realizing it inside of us. Yeah. The story that we're telling. And I think sometimes we can give ourselves a lot of suffering with the trivial stuff as well. Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. (laughs) We do. I'm thinking of someone I know who, is close to me and they just are never happy with anything. It's almost like the automatic reaction to everything is that what's wrong with it? Something's always wrong with it. Something's always wrong with it. And it could be as trivial as the whipped cream or the the placement of the 
the meal that gets brought out to them and they're missing because of that story that's blinding them because of that thought that looks so true they're missing all of the beautiful things around them the environment they live in the trees and the birds outside the loved ones who are sitting around the table with them the phone call that it didn't the phone call didn't come when i wanted it to but the phone call came yeah from someone you know like like but that's me too i'm not picking on this person i just happen to see a lot of suffering there that looks really clear to me. I'm like, can't you see all the lovely things? And they can't in those moments when we're caught up in thought, we can't until we can, until we drop out of it. And then we can laugh at it in a moment. Yeah. Did your, did your husband laugh at that too about the whipped cream? Did he get to that point? No. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if he has now. I must ask him. He actually carried it around with him uh, for about 24 hours before he addressed it with me. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Yeah. Wow. Do you see examples like this happening in healthcare? Oh, yeah. All the time. And, And I do it, too. I really do. So um, the the organization, um, if I if I weren't in this understanding, I would say it causes me the most grief. (laughs) It's called NHS England now. So it's like, you know, the boss organization. And um, I've got a whole collection of stories about how unreasonable they are. And they don't have a, they don't have any idea what goes on on the front line, and they come up with all these ideas. So, yeah, whole collection of stories, and sometimes I really do get so caught up in them, and I forget that actually, it's my story. <laughs> I have been known to roll my eyes when things are mentioned on a Zoom call. You know. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> in this moment, when you when you think about Joe rolling her eyes about something because she's like ugh, playing the story in her head, whatever. What is that? What do you think of that right now? Well, right now I can laugh at it. Yeah, yeah. What does it look like right now? Why is Joe rolling her eyes? What's going on there? Yeah, yeah, because somebody said, oh, when it's just single would have said this, that, and the other, and I thought, for heaven's sake, yeah. <laughs> How glorious it is to laugh at this stuff and, and realise, you know, we've been holding it and kind of keep it warm and, yeah, just let go. And then it's funny. This reminds me of um, an Alan Watts quote. I think it was from one of his lectures. And he was telling a story about how we were born falling, falling into nothingness and holding on to a rock with all our might. Wow. The rock of our obligations and responsibilities and what we have to do and everything we're carrying around. It's like we're, we're holding on to the, the rock of our story, thinking that that's going to save us somehow when we're in a fall (laughs) with the rock and all that we need to do is let go. And we find out we're actually not like we're falling, but there's no ground. There's nothing that's going to hurt us at some point. There's no, there's no big smash at the bottom. Wow. Because, boy, do we ever hold on to our stories. Yeah. Even when we can kind of see they hurt. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I struggle with sometimes is, is talking to people about their stories and how 
how to help them to see that I'm not saying, oh, you're making all this up. It's a story that makes sense to them about what's going on for them, isn't it? And it makes sense because they're not thinking from the inside out. Yeah, the story makes sense. And it makes sense to hold on to it. The cool thing is that we don't even have to let go of our stories. I like, I don't have to get rid of my, the whipped cream is not good enough story. <laughs> and replace it with a new one. I don't have to. As soon as I see that it's a story that I'm telling, that I'm getting really worked up about, it's not so immer- it's not so overpowering anymore. Hey. It's kind of like now I'm watching the movie unfold. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not so attractive either, is it? And if we can see it's a story, we know, oh, it's a story. We know how stories go. You can tell a story. You can tell a new story. You don't have to tell a story. And you don't have to tell that story. (laughs) Yeah. There are infinite choices. Yeah. As soon as I'm laughing at myself, I know I'm like, now I'm starting to see a little more clearly. This is funny. (laughs) Hmm. I was thinking about the implications of that imagining as I am in healthcare like recognizing not only am I telling a story but so is everyone I look at and so is everyone I meet and if somebody is short with me they're curt maybe they're not very kind in their words. It really doesn't have anything to do with me. Even if they think it does, it has everything to do with the story that's happening in their head about what it means and what's happening and how overwhelmed they are or overworked they are and how fed up they are. And you should have, or you shouldn't have. And it comes out their mouth because they don't see it's a story. And I'm imagining that if that was happening in the workplace, if that was happening with my colleagues and I could see it happening, it would be, it'd be quite natural to meet that with compassion instead of flaring up in anger at myself. Yeah. Or it'd certainly be easier to. Not that I would do that perfectly, depending on the story that I'm telling in the moment, right? <laughs> and when you recognize it, isn't it? And sometimes it takes us longer to recognize the story than others. Yeah. Hmm. Have you seen that for yourself, Joe, as you are doing this work with NHS? And, like, have you seen a difference? Yeah. Yeah, I have, actually. I, I was about to say, no, no. Because um, I was already in this, uh, you know, when I started the work that I'm doing now. But, um, well, that's the the work with um, the primary care transformation team. I have to say that it has changed slightly because um, it just feels very easy working with people. I mean, they are really nice bunch of people. Don't get me wrong, and and there is one person mm. that I've struggled to work with, and actually, it feels as though that stuff has has just fallen away. Um, what else about it? Oh yeah, I think I I think I actually told you that I've been totally amazed by. Um, the Christmas feedback from uh, some of my colleagues um, who who described me as being very calm 
And I, I, I read this feedback and thought, who are they talking about? Who is this person who's really calm? <laughs> And actually, it was me. And I, what I hadn't recognised is that when there's stuff going on, so we, we do a lot. Of, we can do a lot of um, workshops over Microsoft Teams, which um, comes with its challenges. Um, things quite often go wrong, especially with breakout rooms got huge stories about breakout rooms on teams that I will not bore you about. <laughs> but actually, I I think the old me would have panicked about those. And it's it's getting harder to panic. <laughs> well that sounds like a nice problem to have. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's how it feels. Harder to panic. <laughs> The funny thing is, and I see this for me too, when I change, when, so, when, it, when, when it looks to me, I don't even know what it is that's changed inside of me, the way I'm seeing the world sometimes. And I think, are other people changing or do I just see them really differently? Because like, this person who used to drive me nuts doesn't drive me nuts anymore. And they seem to be showing up differently. There's something really cool about it and almost invisible. Because that's the power of thought and the story we create with thought, right? It's, it looks invisible. And you have, suddenly you have a new story you're telling with fresh thought. The whole world looks different, including people who showed up in your old story this way, constantly, always. Isn't that weird? It's weird and it's beautiful and it gives me a lot of hope. Because we don't have to change the world to see a different world. Yeah. That's so true. And there's something about turning up in and being grounded. that does have an impact on other people. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, com- it's a combination of both, right? Because we're always co-creating these things. I see them differently, yeah. and I'm showing up differently, and they feel me differently, and they show up differently. There's a new story we're telling together. There's a new creation between us now that's quite yeah. different. I'm wondering if there's anything else you would like to, any other message you'd like to give to people to put out into the world before we close today. The message is, if any of this has made sense to you, to get into a conversation with somebody about it, on a regular base because I think just you know even with the big insights it's so easy for them to fritter away when we get caught up in our stories and forget that they're stories and yeah um just having that contact with other people who see things that way and who can we can remind each other and remind ourselves Mm. that it's one thought away that peace yeah Mm, that's beautiful thank you joe and i'm going to put in a plug for your podcast thank you the hang up your superhero cape podcast and where else can people go if they'd like to connect with you they can visit my website which is settlingthesnowglobe.com. Mm-hmm. Settling yeah. the snow globe. Do you want to tell us quickly before we end what that means, settling the snow globe? Yeah. So when we're in a thought storm, which happens so often, it's a lot like when you get the snow globe and 
shake it up and the snow's going crazy inside. And then as we come back home, recognising that it's our thoughts that are in a storm, that's the snowflakes settling, and that's where we get we fall into calm. Hmm. Beautiful. I got a message from someone on LinkedIn from China saying that um, they wanted me to know that they manufacture snow globes. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to buy snow globes from them, but I thought it was really sweet. <laughs> Well, thank you so very much, Joe. This has been a great pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash Wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.